Stokes. Hey, how's it going? My name is Luke Stokes. You know, I'm one of the witnesses on Steam, and I am currently talking to Sita of Partico. He, as you can imagine, has a pretty frustrated community. The Steam blockchain has had some <laughs> issues. Today is uh, Wednesday, September 26th, and we did move forward with Hard Fork 20, but there were a couple little bugs with the resource credit system, and there were really just some expectations that we tried to communicate but maybe didn't communicate well about it taking about five days for the system to reach equilibrium. And so Partico is an amazing iPhone app. I actually just downloaded it. I look forward to messing with it more. I have been following it just briefly. And there are thousands of users that are excited about using it. And if you're in charge of something like that, it can be extremely frustrating when your users are like, what the heck, how come it doesn't work, especially when they love your product. As you may know, my back history is I ran foxycart.com for 10 years. I built that with my partner. We had thousands of users, uh, thousands of e-commerce stores. We processed over a billion dollars through that. I really care about users and the user experience, about having uptime that's consistent. So I totally emotionally connect to not only what the users are feeling, but also what, what Cita's feeling as well, at trying to support his users. So he asked me to go through some questions about what's going on. And, and we had such a great conversation. We're like, man, let's go back and do it again, but record it. Cause I think it'd be helpful for <laughs> the community. So here we are. Uh, I definitely want you to go through those questions again. Cause I think they were fantastic. And hopefully this will be helpful for people to understand a little bit more about what's been going on behind the scenes with the witnesses, with the steam incorporated developers and what everybody is doing so hard to get this blockchain going. But also we're going to talk broadly about blockchains in general and the coordination problem, and how decentralized systems, the expectations we have of them have to be different than the ones that we're used to with centralized systems. So go ahead, take it away, and, and introduce yourself as well if you want. Yeah, thanks, Luke, for, uh, for you know, taking the call and uh, discuss this situation. My name is Sita, I'm the founder of Particle, and uh, for, you know, like uh, Luke just introduced, we're an application built on top of the Steam blockchain many, many users, and uh, right now I'm somewhat frustrated <laughs> uh, as many, 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 many of our users. But, you know, it seems like the blockchain is running now as the radio is recording, so that's good. So, but basically, we want to explain the situation a little bit. So I guess my, I'm going to run through a couple questions, but basically my first question is, like, what is happening? And people see the blog post, people see, you know, like, you know it's going to take, some amount, some amount of time to before it, you know it goes back up. Yeah, but basically, what's happening? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. It's kind of broad, but it's a good one uh, in terms of like, what the heck? I can't use my application. And that's really what it comes down to the user experience. They have an expectation that you know, like they use Facebook, they use Twitter, like it should just work. And if it's not working, you know, it's a quick fix. The challenge with blockchains is, and I'll just go into a brief little explanation of how they work. In the very beginning, there's, a, there's an ID chain base that you start with, and then every transaction, every block after that uses that information as part of figuring out the next, what they call it, a hash. It's basically a signature. And each one of those are done sequentially. And what makes a blockchain so amazing is it's immutable, meaning you can't change it. You can trust that that information will always exist and they will never be censored. It will never be, you know, you can't go in and change a value that happens in there. It's really important. And so that means that when you're making a fundamental change to a blockchain, they call it a hard fork, you're making a, a consensus change where the old software won't work with the new software, there's a change. You have to run through that entire blockchain again with new rules. And so it reinterprets how it's looking at each one of those transactions and it might change and create a different actual uh, signature for that data. So, so that means it takes a long time. It takes about six hours now to replay a witness node and when you, when you go and make those changes, and for what's called a full node, an API node, this is the nodes that steemit.com uses, all these applications like Partico uses, they connect to this API and they have to get information back and forth for the application to work. Those nodes take a lot longer to run because they have all the history, every single transaction, all your blog posts, all your comments, everything is in there. And those can take up to like a day or more to replay. So even though in this situation, um, so, so that's just kind of the, the groundwork, that this stuff is just fundamentally hits physical laws of nature that it takes time. There's no way around it. it. It takes time to replay the notes. When you do hard forks, you have to replay notes. The challenge is we ran into a bug with the resource credit system. It's a new part of hard fork 20 on the Steam blockchain that is going to, in theory and ideally, prevent people from dominating the blockchain through their spam, through their bots, through basically stealing from everyone else. You know, we all pay for the witnesses through inflation to you know, run the blockchain. And if we have people on the network that can just steal resources 
from others as far as like computation time on the blockchain, disk state time on the blockchain, like the amount of state and, and uh, storage you need and bandwidth on the blockchain, all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's bad. And we cannot grow to millions and millions of users unless we fix that. So Hard Fork 20 does this amazing thing with called resource credits and it's designed to fix that. The challenge is you can't just like start something like that and have it all be set the way you want it. Like you have to start from a zero and then have it kind of figure itself out and reach equilibrium as far as my understanding is. That process according to the Steam blog post that they put out is gonna take about five days or so. So that's one part. So that's just kind of like, that's reality. Unfortunately, and I made a comment on the Steam blog post, they, they were very transparent, which I really appreciate, but they could have been maybe in my opinion, a little bit more transparent to make it very clear that people will see errors. They will try to post it and they will see an error because it's like, hey, you don't have enough resource credits because we got to reach that equilibrium. So that's one part of it. The second part is there's actually was a bug. So a lot of accounts, two of my main accounts had negative resource credits. The way when the blockchain launched, the way that was calculated was not correct. And so that had to be fixed. And that change had to be something that had to be replayed through the entire blockchain again. And so that's why we had so much downtime is we actually, as the witnesses, we had to replay through the whole blockchain and the full API nodes had to replay through the whole blockchain. And during that time where they hadn't replayed, the, the system was reaching that, that, uh, the limit and saying, hey, I have to reject your transaction because you don't have enough of these resource credits in order to transact. And that's why people were getting errors. And it's, um, if you want, we can go into a little bit about how blockchains work as to why we couldn't just like undo it all. <laughs> like in a centralized yeah. system, you could just, you know, it, yeah, you could just revert, right? Like, oh, it didn't work, go back, right? And I even, I did offer this up uh, among the witnesses and kind of got, you know, laughed at a little bit because that's just essentially something you don't do on a blockchain. Because the second you can just revert kind of willy-nilly, um, you, you break trust. And the entire economic system of cryptocurrency is based on trust. It's based on, even though it's a trustless system, it's based on trusting the cryptographic security of the immutability of the blockchain, meaning you cannot change it. And so if we had the ability to just go and change stuff, and you have to worry about the coordination problem of all the different exchanges and all the other wallets and all the other people that that would impact, uh, we would lose trust in the entire network and we could actually lose value. And that's just a very dangerous thing that we would not consider as, as good stewards of the network. So we, we, I did bring it up to at least discuss it and it was, quickly said, no, we can't do that. We already have transactions on the new fork. We have to move forward with the new fork and fix it. So that's what we had to do. Yeah, that's the question I was trying to bring, bring up. And you answered it pretty well. So basically from a, you know, I'm like a, more of an application developer and developer. So I think from our user's perspective and, um, you know, it's super, super frustrated to have something that's like just not working for like an entire day. So like, yeah. um, I mean, it's more frustrating if you look at the, you know, the dashboard where the user activity just goes down. Like, you know, it's like every, oh, every, every, every request you make is an error, you know? And um, so that's why I'm, you know, that's why I'm, me and Particle team is like super frustrated about the situation. But in the meantime, I really appreciate you reach out uh, to, to this call. The one thing I was, kind of struggling with is why can't we just revert it back and there's so many users bring this up so many users like mm -hmm. so many users they know about they know technology you know they bring this up so mm -hmm. i think a look oh. up a good point it's about the trust it's about the trust right yeah, let, so let me uh, i would like i can explain that a little bit more too because again i've been in blockchains for like five years and understanding yeah. that all the value that we're creating in blockchains is essentially a shared delusion, a shared storytelling. We're all believing this story that there's value here. It's just like the pieces of paper with dead people on them. You know, we call them dollar bills. Like they're just pieces <laughs> of paper. It's a story we tell ourselves. And that story, the reason I am so passionate about cryptocurrency is because it's, in my opinion, the best ledger ever invented, the best, most trusted way to, to record, immutably record transactions in a way that everyone has transparency and can see what's going on. That story, that trust is so critically important that we, we can't ever risk in any way invalidating that. We can't, we can't just revert. And, and, and it's totally valid to say, hey, I'm just used to using my application. It should just work. But we're comparing apples and oranges when we do that. We're comparing every experience we've ever had on a centralized system to a completely different concept of decentralized systems. Decentralized systems have something called the coordination problem in game theory. It's extremely difficult. Even if both actors know they could do the right thing and they both win, they, they, they don't know how to communicate and coordinate the decision process to go do the right thing. 
And so they ended up both losing. And it's very, very challenging to solve the coordination problem. And we get this in decentralized systems. And it's one of the most amazing breakthroughs of nonviolent consensus that we also get from the blockchain because we can all coordinate on agreement of like, hey, this is the state of the blockchain in this moment. <laughs> Even if it's not working the way we want it to, you know, we at least can agree on where we're at. And then we can actually get all the people to coordinate to fix the issues. So just a little bit of a backstory. I, I, I want to connect with the emotional feeling of your users and yourself. When I, I can remember one time when I was with my business partner, we were doing a major change over from one infrastructure system to another for my company, Foxycart. And um, we had had so much drama in the past. We'd actually replicated our entire data centers uh, in two different places, paying twice as much infrastructure cost because we just couldn't tolerate any downtime. And so we would switch over from between Arizona and Texas to solve that. So we were, we were finally moving to a more uh, reliable platform. And, and it was broken. It didn't work. And it was so frustrating. And I'm up till 2 or 30 in the morning. And I actually asked my wife, I'm like, bring me a bowl. I'm so nervous. I might actually throw up in this moment. I was like, that intensely anxious because I'm like, I have thousands of stores with their tens of thousands of customers trying to buy stuff, you know, and, and they're losing money, their store is down. And I don't know what to tell them because in that situation, I felt I couldn't even revert. And, and, and thankfully my business partner came up with a great idea. He was able to drop a table that had like, you know, nine gigs and free up some space so we could actually get back. But that moment of anxiety and frustration of like, oh my gosh, my users can't use their system and they're paying us. This is a paid system. They're paying us every month for this. In some, in some cases, a good amount of money. It was so stressful. It was so crazy. And I just, I definitely connect to the emotions that people are feeling when they can't use the application that they love and rely on. Um, in that moment, because we controlled the database, we had an opportunity to revert. In a decentralized blockchain system, those options are physically not available. Like the way a blockchain works, you don't have the option to revert. Now, there have been forks because of, you know, uh, code bugs. And that's a different situation. And it's important, like that happened actually just last week. We had a pretty serious issue with the Steam blockchain where one of the code branches went this way, one of the code branches went this way, and the, the blockchain froze. But because we weren't voting for that fork, it was, a, it was a software bug, we had to go back to the proper, true, you know, user-consented Fork. Again, we have to go back to what the user consents to. That's, what, that's how we build that story of trust. In this situation, we did choose to go through the blockchain voting of the delegated proof of stake witnesses to go to that new fork. So that was the consensus chosen chain. That's the chain we have to stay on and fix. So these are, these are the challenges we face is we have to honor people's intention. And if the code has bugs, we have to fix the code. Yeah. So that's, that's yeah, that's super uh, well said. And um, I guess... One, one, one question, and me and a lot of a lot of our users might have is, could this, could this be more well tested before mm -hmm. before launching, right? So if we say if we had had the chance to, so you know if there's something going on, like the, the developers or the teams should know it, right? Like we still need more time to test, right? Now we only have one week before we can launch the hard fork, right? Mm -hmm. Do we, so now we have two decisions, right? Do we spend more time to test it? Or do we, you know, stick to the schedule and launch the code and which potentially will have a bug? So like, how was this, how was the decision made if you have more information on that? Yeah. yeah, it's a great question. And it's actually one that, you know, the Steam Incorporated is asking too, like what, what are the witnesses doing to test this code that's being put out there and, and all of that. And I, I think that, so I, I did a blog post about that. I'll link to it in the description about kind of what I did as a witness. And then also too, I did another video, hopefully trying to prepare people for this to say, hey, resource credits, this system is, my understanding is gonna potentially cause some issues here. You know, I tried to kind of set expectations to let people know, like it may not work the way we think it is right from the beginning. Um, so there's a couple challenges here um, that I've heard discussed. One is there's a lot of changes in hard fork 20, more so than a lot of witnesses are comfortable with. When it comes to hard forks, if we're voting on this change with our, you know, tokens, we vote in a witness and we say, hey, which direction are you going to go? And the witness says, I'm going to go with this hard fork. You're essentially voting for that hard fork. You're like, yeah, I agree. If you don't agree, then you, again, you vote for a different witness who says, no, 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 I'm not going to support the hard fork. And that's how you can vote with your tokens to determine the direction the code goes. The challenge with a, a, a hard fork that has so many changes in it, like hard fork 20 has been worked on for, I don't know, almost a year since our last hard fork, right? is it's not a single issue thing. It's like, uh, you know, in Congress, you know, they have a bill and they put, you know, a spending bill and they put all these other things in that you don't want, but you're like, but 
oh, there's all this stuff I do want. So you kind of like you're forced to support it essentially, even though, you know, if 90% of it is good and 10% is bad, you can't just be like, ah, I want to carve out the 10%. Now, we did that with Hard Fork 17. We talked about this earlier. Hard Fork 17 on Steam was rejected by the users and the witnesses. And then changes that were preferred were brought into Hard Fork 18. So I think those things can happen, but we have to keep our Hard Fork smaller so that it's just a single issue change. Bug fixes, other stuff like that, improvements, those should be able to go in on, on more regular changes. The challenge with that is, and there's again back to the coordination problem, is you know, even if we have that situation, and some people argue we should have multiple hard forks, like you know, every month or every quarter, you know, doing them regularly. The challenge with that is the exchanges, the wallets, all the other different nodes that are independent in this decentralized system, they then will have to continually upgrade, and that's very time consuming for them. And and on the case of exchanges, it's costly. And they may decide that they're only getting a certain number of transaction fees for the amount of work they're putting in, and they may decide to drop Steam as a token on their exchange. If we lose liquidity as a currency, then we lose a lot of the value because then we're, not, we're no longer usable as a currency. And, and those exchanges provide a lot of that liquidity, so it's important to keep those relationships uh, in good standing. So all that said, um, we do have a testnet, which is fantastic. We didn't have that in the past. Um, we didn't get the full 30 days that we had hoped to really test on that. I don't think enough witnesses really engaged with the testnet as much as maybe they could have, uh, myself included. I was, I was at Burning Man for a week and a half, so I was completely disconnected. And I was also at uh, uh, Puerto Rico for a week, you know, house hunting with my family because they're moving there at the end of the year. And, and so I didn't, this month was a bad month for me. You know, that's just, it's not an excuse. It's just the reality of the way it is. But I still was at least able this past weekend to do some testing, enough to know that the testnet, you know, could have been better. Like, the account creation was set to zero. So the resource credit system didn't quite work the way it does on production anyway. Also the way it got pre-filled with data via Tin Man and Porter, these uh, tools that Steam it built, it kind of distorted the resource credit system. It like got loaded up with a bunch of stuff. So the resource credit system, like the pools were all depleted essentially. And it would again, take about five days for it to kind of reset and find an equilibrium. So we didn't have enough time to really mess with that. But, but ultimately when the discussions among the witnesses were like, are these enough reasons to pull the, pull the plug and say, no, we're not gonna support this. We're not gonna go forward with this date that we've already communicated to all the stakeholders. That was a challenging discussion to have because ultimately via the coordination problem, how, how would we handle all those relationships? How would we tell all those exchanges, we screwed up, uh, we need more testing, uh, you, know, you need to revert to a different piece of code. You know, like if those kind of things came up, um, that would have been a problem and that could have had long-term detrimental impact to the system. And on top of that, and this is another key point that I try to make, there were what, like 19,000 changes or something in that hard fork when you do the diff between them, it's, it's linked to it in my post. I have no guarantee that if we were to delay, we would have found these bugs, right? Like that's like, we found a whole bunch of bugs, right? That never made it to production and those got fixed. I, I've been developing software since 1996. It's like, I, I know that there's no such thing as perfect software. There's always going to be bugs. It's just a matter of how edge case they are. And so that's another part of this challenge is I, I would be open to a delay if I had some form of guarantee that it was beneficial to us. And I don't know that it would have been. And that was part of the discussion we talked about. It's like, we could have delayed, we could have done more testing, but even with the test net, even with more time, we already had a time. We had weeks. And the developers and the you know witnesses and the application you know like like I I could ask you did you run your application against the testnet did you get a chance to do that you're probably busy and probably didn't get a chance right yes 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 so that's so that, kind that's of like everyone's busy so it's like it's one of those things where it's like Steve it could have pushed that harder to be like we're not even going to you know set a date until all the witnesses and application developers have provably shown that they've interacted with our testnet they could have taken that hard stance. But I think I also appreciate that they're like, look, you had weeks. Did you do it? And if we didn't, what, what's to think that we would have done it in the next month, right? Yeah, so decentralized system, I think um, the coordination problem, yeah, the coordination is actually a hard problem. But I, this, is, this is something that I just thought of, that we didn't talk about earlier, but I think there are probably lessons we can learn from other systems where, you know, say like Monero has like scheduled hard fork every six months, mm. right? So I think like, again, like just, just borrowing ideas from traditional software development, you don't want to make changes that's like so big, right? Yeah, yeah. Nobody, nobody likes to look at the huge PRs, 
right? You can't. So I mean, it's just like, it's impossible. Yeah, yeah, you can't I do a code know. review on a year worth of code. It's just, you have to yeah. follow it every day. And even then, the emergent properties of the code change, right? Yeah, every little change. Yeah, so, so, yeah I think there's definitely things we should, we, we should learn about. And, um, um, and then that brings up to the next question, which is, the communication problem. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, to be honest, uh, I think there's a big communication problems in this system. Like, um, like I, I think one tricky part you just mentioned earlier is like, who's the one to, you know, to communicate, right? Because it's a decentralized system. I think steam.com is, you know, I think steam Inc is somewhat like doing it, doing that already, but like people are not like getting the message. Like for example, for this hard fork, we know, a particle as a as a software, uh, uh, you know, we know there's a new system, resource credit system. We know there's going to be some kind of like equal equilibrium adjustment, but we never expected, you know, people yeah. won't post or things yeah. like that. And yeah. uh, and then people like then I I have some information that like the Steam team, the Steam team is working on it. I mean, I'm in the Steam Dev channel. That's how we got connected, mm -hmm. but like users don't. Right. And then, you know, uh, like, you know, people go to the website, they can't, they can't, uh, you know, they, they, they can't uh, post and they don't know what's going on. So I think the, I think the, 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 there's a lot of problems around those things. And uh, I wanted to hear what your thoughts on those and uh, do you have an idea to improve those? So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so I kind of give you a little back history. I've been on steam for more than two years now. And, and last year before steam fest, I did a post called eating your own dog food. And I was pretty frustrated at steam incorporated. I kind of called them out a little bit and you know, I, I think I maybe angered some people there when I did that, but I also got a little respect from people who wanted that kind of conversation to happen. And I'll link to that post as well in the description, but essentially I was pretty frustrated because my understanding of the developers on the team, it didn't seem like they were actually using their own software. So you're probably familiar with this as a developer. Eating your own dog food is a concept in the software industry where you use the tool that you're building yourself. You don't just like you, you know, build it and say, good luck users, I hope it works for you. You're using it every day. So like for example, with Foxycart, we used Foxycart to do our own billing. You know? So we, we build services within our own software, right? We ate our own that's dog food, we used good, it yeah. ourselves. You know? When you use Steam it, you probably use Partico. You know, like when you're on yes, Steam, yeah. the blockchain, yes. you're using Partico, not, not Steam.com or Busy or whatever. You're using your own application, you're eating your own dog food. So I was a little frustrated that from my perspective, Steam Incorporated wasn't doing that. They weren't regularly communicating on the blockchain. And back then there were a bunch of issues as well where people were just getting, you know, the site would just, every other time you reload a page, it would just be a 500 error. It was really, really bad. It was really not working well. And people were mad. There were weeks of people being very mad. And, and the impression was, eh, you know, they're working on it, but it didn't seem like they were angry. It didn't seem like they were like connected to the emotions of like, man, this is broken and we know it's broken and we're working so hard. And, and my impression was maybe they don't connect to how frustrating it is to try to comment and then get an error and then comment and get an error and then comment. Oh, it went through, you know, like that's emotionally challenging. It's like bad Wi-Fi, right? It's like the worst thing you could have happen. Right. And so I was kind of saying, Hey, you know, if you guys use your own thing, you might connect emotionally to what people are doing. And, and, and that I believe influence, I had great conversations with Andrarchy and others. It influenced them to now steam it blog on the steam, it, um, steam chain. Like they regularly post almost every week, a great, like detailed post, professional post about what they're doing on the development side. That's a huge, huge, huge improvement from what they used to do. They didn't used to do that. So that is one thing that I think they're doing very, very well. I want to continue to see that happen. And I'd like to see improvements. One thing that I have brought up, and I've also got a little pushback for this, is the idea that some of these conversations should be more public, you know, where it's not just this kind of closed, connected, you know, conversation in, in, a, in a Discord or a Telegram or a Slack, but it's something that's more public and open. Uh, that brings challenges with it. So one way that I've thought about we could do that potentially is have it be read-only and still locked in for you know a small number of people, Dunbar's number, 150 or whatever that is, because there are certain stakeholders that you need to have conversations and they can't have noise of like random memes and other people just who don't or just frankly uninformed. They don't know what they're talking about. We can't. We, these are important conversations now. On top of that, there are also security implications. So there are situations where the witnesses need to have a private conversation about stuff that's really, really important to fix immediately. That does happen. And this happens in every single software development that deals with real money. You have responsible disclosure processes where you have to be very careful about how you talk about bugs because you fix them before everyone else even knows they exist. That's really, really important. So we have those situations as well and those challenges. So there is a, a time and a place for private communication, especially when the chain is compromised in terms of like issues happening. 
you know, if somebody could just like find out about these and like spam the network with a bunch of you know, stuff and ruin it even worse, that would be bad. So we have to think about all that kind of stuff. So those are the kind of two pieces that I think we can improve on is maybe more real-time communication, maybe in a read-only format where people can be more informed on what's going on. But then also too, and we discussed this earlier a little bit, it's kind of like right now, there's this red banner on steamit.com that's telling people, hey, there's a problem. That's also improvement. They never used to do that kind of stuff. And, and I tried connecting with Steam Connect into your app earlier, and it kind of told me my password was wrong, which I know it's not. It's just an error related to all this other stuff going on. It would be great for Steam Connect and your app and all these other apps to inform people and say, hey, you know what? We're, we're going through some upgrade challenges right now. Here's the status page. That would be another great thing to have, like a full status page that tells, you know, what the downtime is, what the issues are, how, what the team is doing to work on it, what the ETA is, what the, you know, when we think it's going to be fixed. These are all kind of commonly agreed upon practices, best practices for software development and software as a service that we could implement, you know, and, and again, it's, it's, anybody can do it. It's a decentralized system. So it's just a matter of getting out there to do it. I think also too, and I mentioned this a little bit in my post is that the, the actual development of the core blockchain is a little bit centralized with Steam Incorporated right now. I would love to see more developers outside of just one organization contributing code. It is open source. Uh, I'd love to see multiple implementations, maybe not just in C, but maybe in Go or Rust or you know who, Java, who knows what, you know, other implementations of the client potentially. So these are all you know, options we can improve decentralization and user experience. Yeah, that's, that's very well said. Um, one, I think like now, now that we're talking about this, the, 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 the decentralization versus centralization problem, right? So Steam is kind of in the intersection where if you talk about, you know, if you think about Bitcoin, you know, people don't have the expectation that it's going to be like super, super mainstream, right? I mean, like everybody knows it. Like everybody, everybody knows how to buy it, but you don't expect Bitcoin to be like, like widely used by your grandpa. Basically. Yeah, yeah. It's not it's not easy to use yet. Yeah. Yeah, I mean like you know, it's like there's there's something that's that's kind of hard to get through. Like the the the, the, the passphrase, things like that. I think Steam is in our inter intersection, like you know, like between traditional software and blockchain software, right? It has the user facing aspect, right? And that's what you talked about before where particle is on the cutting edge where we deliver a user experience that's like doesn't seem blockchain at all right yes, this is yes. the experience that's just like traditional social platforms however the underlying technology is like still very early stage and i truly agree with that i mean although i feel like for the most part you know the steam just works fine but you know for situations like this i realize this is like early stage right it and is more, and I said this earlier, you are absolutely an amazing pioneer. You know, like the analogy is you're going out into the forest and cutting down trees and building homes, you know, you're, you're homesteading this new cutting edge technology space and you're doing it in a way, like you said, perfectly. It's like, it's bridging the gap between what people are used to where they have, you know, known expectations, Twitter, Facebook, things just work. They're centralized. You can just do whatever you want to the database and this new decentralized system where there's a whole new set of expectations. So, you know, people have to understand blockchain on some level to recognize, oh, you can't just fix things. Sometimes it's going to take, you know, a day to replay a full node as an example before the application will start working again. And these are just hard costs of time that you can't get around. But, but we are, we're in this transition period. I mean, it's one of the reasons I got so passionately excited about Steam is I was involved in blockchain since I bought my first Bitcoin in 2013 in January. You know, I've been in the space for a long time and I watched how, you know, there was just, drama between the Bitcoin users and the miners and how that centralization of power within the miners, you know, really caused a problem where it's like the users had to pay higher and higher fees and the, the chain worked less and less efficiently for them. And, and so when I saw on-chain governance with delegated proof of stake and you could have these different independent witnesses, these, these block producers that are directly supported by the token holder stake to vote. So the user's intentions mattered. It was beautiful. Now, now, now I saw this alignment of, of, uh, you know, uh, intention and motivation and all that to the point where the user gets a say. And I think we mentioned it hard fork 17 on steam didn't go through because the users were like, no, and the witnesses were like, Hey, we don't agree with these changes. And so then it was not until hard fork 18 that those changes were fixed and, and improved. So, so I'm excited when I see stuff like that. Like I think this governance model we have on, on steam is works and, and, it, and it's also on BitShares. It's also on EOS. I think delegate proof of stake is an amazing thing. Um, and account recovery and like all these other cool features it has uh, free transactions three second block times. It's beautiful It's an amazing you know, technology, but 
it's still a completely different paradigm. It's decentralized governance. It's decentralized systems. There's no one person that you could just, you know, call up and say, Hey, fix it and be responsible because it's, we're all responsible. It's, it's like a shared collaborative commons. We all have stake in this system and protecting the value there. Yeah. So I think one question I, like I, I, I had before, and I think a lot of people also have is, um, so I expected like the, the steam blockchain and dedicated proof of stake to be like more centralized than technologies like Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. That's like, that has been my expectation. Cause like when we talk about like, uh, scalability, security and decentralization, you can always have, you know, like trade-offs, right? Yeah. And yeah. It's hard, it's hard to have all of them. And, um, for steam, we, we, we somehow have the scalability. Like we, we have, we like our, uh, transaction is the steam transactions, like faster, a lot faster than, you know, old, like older blockchains. So that makes me think it's more centralized. Right. And that yeah. makes me think when, when a problem shows up, it's going to take more time to fix. So I think that's, that's another kind of, you know, the mis- miscommunication we're having right now. Maybe you can clarify that a little bit. Yeah, it's a really good point. And I, I, I speak at conferences and I talk to different people and often they're like, oh, EOS and Steam and whatever, they're centralized. You know, they think it's a centralized system, just like you said, because it has that uh, cooperation over competition as far as how the blocks are produced. You know, they're ske- the block producers are scheduled. And so they look at that as a, you know, well, that's a centralization. You know, you only have 20 block producers. We have all these other nodes, right? But in reality, if, if the way you look at it, there's actually three major mining pools that manage like Bitcoin and, and similar I- I situation with Ethereum and the Ethereum Foundation. So there's, there's a lot of centralization with the block production. And we saw that in 2014, 15, 16, where the users were very upset and they wanted to go a different direction as the miners, but they couldn't. You know, a lot of people wanted larger blocks. So eventually we got a whole fork of Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Core, won't get into all that. But the point being is th- there was no way to like it was so centralized that the, all these individual users didn't have a say. So then they introduced the concept of a, a user initiated uh, or uh, uh, user activated. Activated. Software. Thank you. Yes. A user activated hard fork or soft fork. And that um, was kind of their only way to say, Hey, we want to do something different. But the way I think about that, it's almost like pulling a pin on a grenade and being like, Hey, I'm about to blow all of us up. Cause it's like, we're either going to reject as a full node runner. We're going to reject you know, your transactions we don't agree with. And then the whole network is going to have problems because obviously the miners, you know, mine the blocks. So um, I, I, I like that DPoS has a more cooperative method for governance to say, hey, you, you via your staked weighted token, you get to vote for who the block producers are. If somebody is a bad actor, you get to remove them. If they don't have intentions that match up with you, you get to vote for someone else. And so in many ways, it's even more decentralized because you have 20 different independent block producers that are the, the main ones that are running. And then you've got a, from a, like a hundred something backups, they get rotated in as the 21st every 63 seconds. So there's always this diversity in the block production. And I, I think that's a really beautiful thing. And so it does give us this decentralization. But as I mentioned it, it, earlier, the code is still being kind of centrally developed in, in, a, in a lot of ways by Steam Incorporated as a for-profit organization. So I would like to see a more decentralized, more open source, like a lot of witnesses and community members contributing core code to the blockchain. I think that will help even further with decentralization. But it, like you said, it does create some challenges in that when you want to make a change or fix something, you have to, it's a coordination problem again. You have to get all these people to agree. And that can be challenging. You know, that can be challenging in all decentralized systems. Yes, because like um, before we had this discussion, I was, I was, I had a, I had the impression where, you know, like all the witnesses like are closely like connected, like, the, 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 you know, it's very, it's fairly, it, it should be fairly easy to make changes to the code and upgrade. But now you're, you're telling me like, like differences, like different like witnesses, they're all independent. Right. And, um, like for, for you, like you, you were kind of like, uh, yeah, you know, like doing something on your own and didn't have the time to 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 to, to, to do the witness stuff. So it's, there might be, different people have might have different situations, and um, it's kind and, of a coordinate problem. Yes. Yeah, and like you said earlier, we can learn from this in terms of we know as witnesses and as application developers that we need to do more testing. You know, like like you could have taken Particle and connected it to the test network and run through some stuff and been like, hey, this doesn't work the way I expect it. 
And then we could have maybe improved the test network to be a little more accurate. You know, maybe there's something we could have done to, you know, jack with it, you know, maybe even customize the code just for the test network. I mean, that's an option. We could do whatever the heck we want there to kind of like bootstrap the resource credit system as we think it's going to be in production. You know, who knows? There's a number of things we could have tried. We just didn't have, in my perspective, we didn't have enough people actually using the tools that were provided because everyone's busy. You know, it's like, why would I spend a week doing this over here when I've got, you know, bug fixes on my application that users are want fixed, you know, like you, you're trying to make yeah, it yeah. better. It doesn't make yeah, sense yeah. to just pause and like, you know, go do all this testing. Nobody likes testing. It's not fun. It's not sexy. It's not, you know, <laughs> and so, so it's like, I think we're all, we should, we can all take some responsibility for this. You know, it's easy That's to good. just blame uh, uh, it and yeah. say, Hey, you know, they did provide us with a test network. That's awesome. Like that wasn't the case in the past. You know, we are making improvements. So, so I think it's, and also too, like we already talked about, there are physical limitations, like based on atoms and physics and how cryptography works, there are limitations to what can be done on a blockchain. You have to rerun and replay through a blockchain from the beginning transaction all the way to the now. And that takes hours. And there's just, until we improve hardware, that's just unavoidable. Like that just will take that time and it will take, it will get longer as we add more data to the blockchain. So, so these are, these are realities that we have to face. Yeah. Now that we're talking about this, like, like uh, replay time, right? So, um, so my understanding is that every time we need to, uh, change something every time we have a new like software that's like incompatible with the old software hmm. we need to uh, replay the entire block meaning we have to like go through all the block history data from the first block yeah up until the like latest block to be able to like have the clean data to have so, consensus yeah so so with consensus. that uh, something that's worth talking about is that app base, which is part of uh, version 1912 that came out or about 1910, whenever that first came out, that's a really amazing improvement because it, it splits out a bunch of things into different APIs so that we talked about earlier, that coordination problem with exchanges in theory, as we roll forward, there'll be things that are part of the core consensus of the blockchain itself, such as transactions. Like you sent me five bucks and I sent three of those dollars to somebody else. Like we all have to agree on that financial stuff, but then there are going to be other perspectives like, does, does an exchange really care if you upvoted my post? Well, probably not, right? <laughs> so there are aspects of that that they're moving outside of the core consensus and basically having this kind of soft consensus just between the witnesses. So it still requires a replay for the witnesses, but it wouldn't require a replay for the exchanges and, and the wallets. And so that's where there's another aspect of this that's really important is that even the Steam blockchain itself is becoming more modular and decentralized to solve some of these coordination problems so that in the future, not everyone will have to do a full replay. And not only that, and this is another exciting part about it, is that you, we're gonna have uh, full nodes that will just run one aspect of the blockchain. So like this node runs the JPC, you know, the, the you know, JSON RPC, for example. This node runs, you know, account history. This node runs, you know, so you could actually decentralize your infrastructure and your architecture as well. So that you could, you know, maybe this part needs three different servers that are behind a proxy and they're, you know, they're scaling. You know, maybe this one just needs one server, you know. And so, so they've done some really amazing design work on this blockchain to handle millions and millions of users. So I'm pretty excited about that. But, you know, we just, we don't see all that yet because it's still being developed, you know. So yeah. the point of that being there might be pieces that need replays and other pieces that wouldn't. So you'd have a whole lot of functionality that's working just fine, but maybe one part of it doesn't work until that replay happens. You know, that would be a different experience than we have now where it's all in one gigantic server. That's a great, yeah, that's a great thing to improve, making, making it more modular. And as we, as the Steam blockchain gets more users, right? So even if the core part, I mean, it's going to like get bigger and bigger, right? So one, one concern I have is how is this thing gonna, you know, how is this thing gonna scale? I mean. Um, for example, like, net, like in, in, in future scenarios where, you know, we need to replay the block, we play the, replay the blockchain, you know, it's going to take longer and longer, right? Like that's, that's one, that's one thing we have to think about early. And, um, uh, like, I, are there like, situ are there solutions being, being discussed already? Like, um, like do do, are we, do do we do we do do we want to like uh, use some more technologies to 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 make the replay faster, or like are we relying on some technology advancements or both? Yeah, yeah it's a great question, and 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 I'm 
you know, I'm, I'm pretty technically savvy, but I, there are some genius people level at talking about some of this stuff. So I, I, I can't, I can't talk as effectively as some of them, but from what I've heard from the conversations I've seen, um, app base is an improvement to other storage mechanisms like chain base or other things that we've done in the past. And, and so that alone gives it a nice improvement. Um, even graphing technology was an improvement on previous technologies. Now there are potentially even better technologies that we could move to in the future. Also, there's the idea that if you could, if there was a way you could take a snapshot of the block log while it was still running, you know, that might give us more opportunities to not have to like, you know, do as many replays. Um, there's also the idea that you could potentially, you know, take a snapshot and then truncate. You know, that's another thing that's been brought up in the past where it's like, well, as long as we have a, a guaranteed hash, we all agree to, anybody could download that, that truncated data to verify that hash if they really wanted to. But ultimately, you know, you could take, you could take, and, and, and you know, EOS is kind of doing this in some way. They're, the account history plugin, they're talking about deprecating. And, and again, we talked earlier, I'm not a crypto tribalist. I, I am involved in multiple projects. I'm also, uh, you know, part of EOS DAX because I believe in DAX. I think it's an amazing idea. So I learned from all these different um, projects and they help me become a better uh, advocate for whatever project I'm working with. So in this case, they're talking about, you know, the, the, the transaction history, that that plugin being disabled to the point where you would store that data in MongoDB or you'd store it in some other traditional database, but each and every block producer, each and every node would be responsible to have that data available. And it's all again, verifiable on the chain. So you wouldn't have to, you know, go that route. You could definitely verify. So it's still immutable, but it's kind of like, it's almost cheating just a little bit, right? Like, but again, this is what's the beauty of cryptographic hashes. If you, if you want to go, you know, into that a little bit, I have a video I did for understanding blockchainfreedom.com where I explain what how blockchain works and it's a little demo it's a 17 minute video we, that, that i linked to that you can just walk you through what a hash is and it's this idea that if you change one character in a set of data the hash you get the answer is completely different and and it's, so it's provably a one-way system where you know that nothing's been tampered with so so yes there, there, i think there are solutions there's also obviously hardware improvements you know the the new nbm or and i'm sure if i'm saying that right new new hard drives solid state hard drives much much faster um RAM is becoming cheaper as well. Obviously, you know, some of this is also CPU based. Even if you had the entire block, block login RAM, you still have to sequentially go through it and that takes, you know, CPU, CPU cycles. So improvement to the code actually for, for replaying the blockchain, uh, improvement to you know, the actual hardware. I think there are solutions. I, I think that, um, you know, obviously an hour, a day of downtime is not ideal. And so we want to avoid that. And ideally, if there were no bugs in this process, that wouldn't have happened. You know, everyone had been re would have been replayed beforehand, and it would just smoothly transition into the new system. But you know, yeah. it doesn't always work out perfectly. <laughs> yeah, I think it's good to acknowledge that you know there there are things that are not going well, and uh, you know, one day downtime is you know we definitely don't want this thing. We don't want don't we, nobody wants this more of this in the future. So. So it's good to acknowledge, and uh, it's good that we're having this, having this discussion. Yeah. I hope. And, and too, like even know. the resource credit thing is another example of a challenging thing yeah. where it's like they have to bootstrap it in and it has to reach equilibrium, and that may take five days. So it's kind of like if I was in their shoes, what would I do? It's kind of like I, I have no choice. I have to introduce new code to the blockchain that calculates this new thing, and it has to figure itself out, and it's kind of like, we just have to let everybody know, like, sorry, it's going to suck for a week, you know, but then ultimately, hopefully we'll be in this position to, again, scale for millions of users. And so it's like, these are the hard decisions that I applaud Steemit Incorporated for making, even though it's a bummer. Yeah, it is a hard decision. So it seems to me that there's no way to like, to like not start from zero, right? It, it, this has to start from zero. Is that, that's my understanding. I mean, I this just, is, yeah. And again, that's why it's like, if you play with actual cryptographic hashes, this makes more sense where it's like, if you were to just change one little thing, the entire hash changes, and then that hash is used as input to the next block. And so again, that's a change so that you get a new hash. And so, yeah, and I, I'll link to that. Uh, there's even a demo website. We can play with this and demonstrate it and see how this works. The way blockchains work is they're all connected all the way back to that uh, original Coinbase, that original original transaction. So, it, you know, yeah, you do have to replay the whole thing so that all that consensus is agreed upon with nodes all over the world, you know, that they all have the same answer and exactly the same answer. That's really important. So, yeah, so as for the like RC system, I guess that's probably my last question. So for the RC system, so it takes five days to reach equilibrium. 
right? So is that is that by design or like can that can, like do you have knowledge behind the RC system where could, there, is there a, is there a possibility where it can be designed better from the beginning where? Yeah, uh, I wish I, I wish I had better answers for that. I mean, I like I said, I, I played around with the test net this past weekend, and I did mess with the RC API plugin. But I just think, unfortunately, we don't have enough developers, and we don't have enough witnesses, and we don't have enough people testing on the test net to figure that out. Um, so we've been told that it will reach equilibrium in five days. Will there be new bugs we discover then? I don't know. Like we talked about earlier, that's one of my biggest concerns is that we have this expectation that things are going to get better and, and maybe they will, maybe they won't. Maybe low SP counts, low steam power accounts will like still not be able to transact. That would be terrible. And then you get, you're going to get all this like, err, steam isn't about equality. It's just for the whales. You know, it's like you could have all this kind of drama. And so, you know, I, th I think in that situation, we're just going to watch it over the next few days very, very closely. And if we find it's not, reaching an equilibrium that the community agrees with, then we will have to reevaluate. And maybe worst case scenario, you know, more replays, more changes, more, you know, ideally not while uh, things are massively broken, but yeah, these are the kind of things we'll have to deal with. Cool. Yeah. This is a truly valuable conversation. Uh, thank you, Luke, for, for having this conversation with me. I, I hope this thing, this, this video can clarify a lot of the confusions. I hope, People watch this video. I mean, if you can, <laughs> maybe you can cut this video in, you know, half, you know, into different sections so that it's easier for people to watch. Um, but, but yeah, I really, yeah, I really appreciate it. You're very welcome, and and thank you again for reaching out to me. This is like, I, you know, when I talk about being a witness, this is a, a paid position. This is a position the blockchain pays me through voluntary inflation. So you basically all the users, you know, they have their purchasing power decreased to pay block producers and witnesses. You know, and so I, I appreciate the role and, and the trust that I'm given as a, as a witness. So it's my pleasure to be able to do stuff like this. This is kind of my job is the way I see it. So thank you again for reaching out for me and I will I'll put this uh, video up on YouTube as quickly as I can. So hopefully people can watch it and get some understanding. And, and if there's anything that I didn't say correctly, again, that's the coolest thing about this is I can't represent the whole blockchain. I'm just one person. It's a decentralized system. So if I did say anything that isn't completely accurate as far as Steemit Incorporated, I don't work for them. I'm not an employee of them or any way, then they can clarify that. If there's anything where I misrepresented witnesses in any way or the users, you know, it's like, it's just one perspective. And you're again, just giving one perspective of the application developers on the Steam blockchain. But I think we did have a good conversation and I think it'll be helpful for a lot of people. So thank you again for reaching out and for having the time to do this. I think it'd be good. All right, thanks so cool. much.